Parkland formula, and now we've got to make sure our Parkland formula is working. So it's kind of like a concept map, the nursing process, everything that we talk about. Let's talk about it. We've assessed the patient. We have identified that there's a problem. We've given them a diagnosis. We have now got nursing interventions. Our nursing interventions is that Parkland formula. Are we done there? No. No. We've got to see if what we're doing is working, right? And so that's what we do now. Now we start that Parkland formula and now every hour continuously one-on-one -on -one, we are reassessing that patient to determine if what we are doing is working. Our goal of the Parkland formula is to keep organ perfusion. And so now we've got to determine our organs being perfused. So what do we look at? What is our goal statement if we are looking to see if we have organ perfusion? Urine output, that lets us know if kidneys are being perfused, right? So we are looking at urine output. If that urine output is not hitting our 0.5 to 1 meals per kilogram per hour, what are we going to do? Leave it alone? No, we're going to increase it. I mean, this is nursing. This is your concept map over and over again. If it doesn't work and we evaluate it and the goal wasn't, we didn't hit that goal, then we change what we're doing. In this case, we're changing the Parkland formula. Let's say there are electrical burns and they are meeting one mil per kilogram per hour, but the specific gravity is extremely high. We're still going to increase it because we're not getting the results that we are looking for. Same thing with heart rate, the same thing with blood pressure. As we put fluids on this, what do we anticipate their heart rate doing? Coming down. Now, bradycardic? No. Less than 100? Yes. Blood pressure, we anticipate it rising. Now, are they going to have a 160 systolic? No. But anything greater than 90, consider it a success. Like you have won the jackpot of the day if you've got a systolic pressure of 90. And that's how we can go home. We're going to lecture. We're going to talk. You don't have to look at it. Because you got to get through this. It's getting ready to get warm, guys. Power went off. It's going to take them a while to reset the thermostats. Right. As long as they don't do this too, <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. So let's talk about that. What if it does this Tuesday, Quan? What are you going to do? Take a makeup. No. You're going to sit tight, keep your mouth shut, and take a deep breath. Because guess what? When the power comes back on, it will pick right back up where you left off. <laughs> and guess what? I can adjust how long you have left. Okay. So I can turn around right, right, on, on the big end and go add 10 minutes and give you your time back. Or another 60 minutes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Good try. I mean, we'll take it, right? So that being said, it is not, it's not ATI. We have absolutely 100% control over everything that is in Blackboard. So if it, if it, power goes off, if it freezes up on you, if the computer lab's not working, if it updates and shuts your computer down, guess what? I can guarantee you I can get you back in it. You just gotta be patient. You can't, you can't freak out on me. You cannot sit in that chair and hyperventilate and disrupt <laughs> the rest of the class. Like if you feel like you're gonna get lightheaded, you have to go outside. My first semester teaching, I was in the PN program and we had, it was finals, and we were over in Wallace, Wallace Hall, I think, is where, no, I was in the science building giving this final. I was the only instructor in the science building that day. I think, like, all the science department took the day off or something. I had a student pass out sitting at the computer chair, like, hit the ground in the middle of the exam. The only instructor. Cell phones don't work in the first floor of the science building, by the way, because there's, like, you don't get a cell phone signal. I was like, okay, do I interrupt all the other students? <laughs> do I? Who do I call? There's no one in the building. I open the door and look. There's no one around. <laughs> do I drag her outside? <laughs> what, what do I do? What do I do? I did make sure she was breathing. She was okay. She had just hyperventilated or something and hit the ground. She had that vagal response. I let her lay there for a little while. She was nice and diaphoretic. Sure enough, a little while later, she came to me. I was like, thank God, because I couldn't call anybody. <laughs> <laughs> oh, gosh. Killing myself here.
we officially get done with class? I have no idea. <laughs> with congestive heart failure, we would have to add drugs in combination with fluids. They just can't handle 17, 20, 23 liters of fluid. They'll die from congestive heart failure. So we look at adding things like digoxin to them. That one just left me. Thank you. Um, dopamine. Dopamine. Dopamine, digoxin are the two that we tend to add to these patients um, with congestive heart failure to compensate or offset some of the fluid resuscitation that is required. Do y'all let me turn this front light off again? Yes, it makes it a little easier to see the. I love the way I walk in in the mornings and y'all are all just sitting in the dark. Like, is it protest? Uh, you're protesting the day, deciding if you're going to get started or. <coughs> all right. So when we talk about plasma exchange therapy and CRRT and CVVH, the goal of this, or all of these, is to remove chemical mediators. Remember, this whole process occurs because there are chemical mediators released into the bloodstream that causes everything that we have talked about for two days with burn. If we will turn around and put this patient on some type of plasma exchange therapy or CRRT, we filter out those inflammatory mediators. If we get rid of those inflammatory mediators, we cut down on the severity of the systemic effects of the burn. So we, we don't have to give them as much fluid because they're not gonna have as much fluid shifting. So how do you think the patient that ends up on CRRT fairly quickly does in comparison to the patient that does not get CRRT? They don't swell as much, so their outcomes are better. much better because they don't have the vascular volume loss that a patient that doesn't receive CRRT or plasma exchange therapy um, has. That's why we want them um, in burn centers so that they will start this and cut down on this process that is occurring. We talked about in the resuscitative phase comfort, we give IV um, pain meds. We will never get rid of all of their pain. Burns hurt. Um, we cannot get rid of their pain. We need to pre-medicate them prior to debriding and dressing changes. We need to make sure we are using things like silvadine to help with the burn of the pain uh, of the the pain of the burn itself. Silvadine is a topical. Silvadine is, and we're gonna get to it in just a second. It's a broad spectrum antibiotic, but have you ever had a burn and you put silvadine on it? It is like instant relief. It's like sitting there and holding your hand under cool water when it's burned. It's that instant relief that you get. Um, we also have to think about non-opioid analgesics, things like Neurontin. When do we typically give Neurontin? Neuropathy. For neuropathy, nerve pain. Typically our diabetics get Neurontin, but aren't their nerves injured? They're painful, give them Neurontin. It will help with some of that nerve pain that they're having. We also have to think about keeping the room comfortable. If the patient is cold and shivering, what is that gonna to do to their pain? It's gonna increase. We've gotta make sure their room's comfortable for them. We've gotta make sure that their positioning is comfortable for them, that there's not an excessive amount of noise or stimulation in a room. We've gotta look at some of those things as well. Um, music, it calms a lot of patients. 
it gives them that opportunity to to relax um, and maybe think of something other than the pain that they're receiving with uh, from the burns. But we do give lots and lots of narcotics. What do you think happens to their narcotic usage in comparison to other patients? It is much higher. Why? Because it takes more to like their pain is severe, so it's going to take more. But why else? Their, their, uh, their metabolism. Their metabolism is increased. Remember, two to three times normal metabolism. So guess what? They're going to burn two, burn through pain medicine two to three times faster than other patients. So other patients might get one of the lauded every two hours. This patient might get two of the lauded every 30 minutes or every hour. They are going to burn through the pain medicine because that metabolism has increased. Fentanyl drips are really big right now. We use lots of fentanyl drips. We'll use them on burn patients as well. The downfall to narcotic use, what is it going to do to our pressure? Drop, drop, drop it. We'll drop it. So now you get to, to walk the tightrope of how much pain they're in versus what their pressure is versus how much fluid you're giving them. There's, there's a balancing act there. That's why you have to think outside of just the narcotics. Wound debriding. Um, there are several different types of wound debriding. Um, hydrotherapy showers is one of them. There's different types of hydrotherapy shower. Essentially, a hydrotherapy wound debriding means we're using water to remove dead tissue. Now, um, in later stages of burns, that might be just a general shower itself, running water, removing dead tissue. In early phases of burns, it is things like um, these little pressure washers that we have that we use on the skin. You hook a bag of saline to it, and it's under pressure, and you clean wounds with them. Um, you may also see debriding done. Manual debriding is where the nurse is sterile sterile gown gloves mask hairs covered the whole nine yards and we use tweezers and scissors and we cut dead skin off that's manual debriding that typically occurs around the hands and the face is where we do manual debriding we can also use enzymatic debriders where in the dressing change we're putting that enzymatic debrider on and while it is sitting there, it is eating away, the enzymes are eating away at dead tissue, leaving a good, healthy tissue alone. And then, of course, we can go to the OR for debridement as well. When we debride wounds, we need to make sure the room temperature is about 85 degrees. Guess what? 85 degrees, you're guess, dressed out in sterile gown and gloves and mask and, and hair nets. You better hope you wore some good deodorant that day. <laughs> or at least the person you're with did because it is going to get warm. And you may not have heard it yet, but Dr. DeBose and I will tell you over and over this semester, it ain't about you. Yeah. Who's it about? It's about the patient that is in that bed. Because if we leave the room at 65 degrees, we have them exposed with no barrier, their skin is gone, what are we going to do to their body temperature? It's going to drop. Cold, when they are cold, they're hypothermic, what happens to perfusion? It decreases. So here we are setting this patient up for poor perfusion if we let them get cold. It also slows drug metabolism. So if we're giving them anything to help with pressures, we're giving them anything, um, we're going to slow that metabolism of that drug as well. We're not going to get bogged down in dressings. There are 10 million thousand dressings that are available that we can use on burns. What do you need to know? That they're sterile. And they are at the discretion of the physician that is using them. That is really it. Standard dressings is probably what we use the most, which is sterile 4x4s and cling. 
That is your standard dressing. That is probably your big, what we use the most in this area. When you get to some of your major burn areas, centers, you will start seeing by, uh, synthetic uh, membranes like this one. This is a dressing. Isn't it kind of cool? All right, so what do we like about that dressing? It's clear. You can see the burn through that dressing. It's also permeable. It's semi-permeable to be specific. It will allow fluid to weep out, but keeps things from coming back in. Almost got those um, holes, almost have valves on them. So we don't have to worry about that dressing filling up with fluid. It leaks out. So what does that help with, with keeping them dry? You think that helps? Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely, because now we can just lift them up and change the pad every so often, and we don't have to mess with the dressing. The dressing's still intact. Um, but that is one of those um, synthetic dressings. There's lots of them out there. When we get to grafting, that is permanent. Dressings are, are not permanent. We change those. You'll go through lots and lots of dressings. Your grafts are permanent. And we'll look at a video of grafting in just a second. Um, there's a break in the skin. They all need a tetanus shot. <coughs> they all need prophylactic antibiotics. We start range of motion on these patients in this acute resuscitated phase, whether it's passive and we're doing it for them or it's active. What if they have burns at the elbow? Are we going to move that arm? No. Yes, we are. Why? If we don't move it and we leave it in one place, what's going to happen? They're going to get contractures. Absolutely. Because that skin will grow back in the position that they are and then you lose range of motion. So even in burned areas, we are going to do range of motion. I bet that hurts like hell. You better medicate me first to do range of motion in a burn area. Fingers, the same way. Elbows, shoulders, knees, hips. It doesn't matter. We still do range of motion in burned areas. Now, is that going to tear, tear the new skin that's developing? Yep, mm -hmm. it is. But we've got to do that so that we de ultimately uh, don't lose range of motion in that joint. Same thing with positioning. If we let a patient position um, in an area that we can develop skin contractures, they'll lose range of motion. The little the boy that's up in the top picture, now he's on the OR table. However, notice he doesn't have a pillow. He has a towel roll. His burns are to his neck. So if we gave him a pillow and his head was tilted forward, what would happen to the skin here at his neck? Exactly. And so then we would never have that full range of motion. So you have to think about neutral positions. The bottom picture, that person's burned on their hands. They've got the hands in a neutral position. If you notice, if your patient's in the unit and they're sedated, what do their hands tend to do? Kind of just roll up. That natural we resting position is a ball. But if they're burned on the hands and we let their hands stay like this, then they will never be able to use their hands again. So we put them in neutral positions. So you think about whatever joint it is and what is neutral, we still do range of motion with them or for them depending on how they are. We don't spend a lot of time in the acute phase, and this is why. The acute phase is nothing but an extension of the resuscitative emergent phase, but guess what? They're getting better. So if we make it to that acute phase, remember that acute phase starts with diuresing. So that tells us that vascular volume has what? Returned. It's good. So we have perfusion. We have a hemodynamically stable patient as we move into the acute phase. Now our goal of this acute phase is to get them closer to discharge. So if the patient was intubated during this acute phase, guess what we're going to do? We're going to extubate. If they didn't have bowel sounds at the end of the resuscitated phase, we move into this acute phase, bowel sounds return. Now how are we going to start feeding this patient? We may pull an NG tube and we may start with a liquid diet, but we're going to start feeding the gut through this, this phase. We're going to go from liquids to softs to solids to them eating on their own. This is that transition phase to hopefully get them out of our facility. 
They're on IV pain medicines. At some point, can they go home on IV pain medicines? No. no, we've got to transition them from IV to PO. Now, that one's tough because they are still hurting. But it might go to IM. It might go to sub-Q. And then it might go to PO meds. We're going to transition out of that IV to, to um, PO meds. Again, this phase is much longer. When we look at it, um, we're going to look at, let's see, I don't remember how I have it laid out exactly. Um, we mentioned most of this. In this phase, we have the return of bowel sounds. Um, if the patient was neurologically either sedated or not intact, maybe because of a chemical they've inhaled, maybe because of water intoxication, we hope during this phase that we receive, we, we have a patient that returns to some type of alert and organ um, status neurologically. Um, we're still working muscular skeletal wise with range of motion. This is where it may go from passive to active range of motion. Um, this is where we will start pulling lines and instead of central lines, we may just have peripheral lines. Um, so this is that transition phase. The big thing in this phase is we're trying to prevent infection and we're trying to get the wounds closed because we don't get out of this phase until we have wound closure. But guess what? We can have a patient discharged in this phase. Patients won't stay in the hospital with an open wound. What will they do? Wound care. Wound care. Well, they'll come back in for either daily or twice a week or three times a week wound care. So just because the wound is not closed doesn't mean that they will not leave our facility. They will. They may go to a rehab facility, but they will, they will not necessarily stay in the acute care setting um, during this phase. Toward the end of this phase, we hope they are moving out of it. Psychological. This is where we really will focus on the psychological effects of burns. We may have to do things like role-playing. How are you going to handle people staring? What is your response going to be when questions are asked? Um, those type of things. This is where we bring close family, friends in to a safe environment, the hospital, their hospital room, so that they know how people are going to react to them. Um, we will do those type of things to prepare them for being discharged into society what we'll do in this phase as well. Again, what they're putting on the patient in this picture is just a um, standard dressing. Again, we can use enzymatic and mechanical debriding. We can also debride in surgery, um, but many of the times we're using just a standard dressing on these patients. There's lots of different types. Um, if, they, if it is a, a homograft, it is human skin. If it's heterograft, it's typically pig skin. We can have amniotic dressings, which is truly that. It is the um, amniotic sac um, that they will use and use as skin. We can grow skin in labs. Cultured skin is where they actually take skin scrapings of that person grow it out in the lab, and then transplant it onto the person. It's extremely expensive and extremely time consuming. So we see very little cultured skin used. We can also, uh, again, see all types of synthetics that are there as well. I mentioned sylvadine earlier. Again, it is a broad spectrum antibiotic. Uh, it is used on the wound. However, it does not cover pseudomonas. So if you have a patient that <coughs> develops pseudomonas, you have to go to a myosin drug. Genomyosin is the most common. However, what are some concerns about a myosin drug? Being toxic. That's right. Nephrotoxic and ototoxic. These patients will complain about ringing in their ears with the ototoxicity. Another nice thing about sylvidine is that it does not cause changes in the patient's electrolytes.
I'm going to show you this video of grafting. Now, this is not a burn, but it is the same concept. So I want to show you what grafting looks like. Can I just open my PDF? That would be nice. part of the skin, usually the epidermis and part of the dermis, and we can move that skin to another part of the body in order to heal a wound or a burn. This is a very common procedure performed by plastic surgeons, and I get a lot of questions about it from patients and students. So enjoy the video, and please feel free to email or call with questions. Thanks. Here is a wound that is now prepared for skin grafting. The dermatome is placed together on the back table. Care is taken to insert the blade properly and carefully. The guard is chosen and placed, and you have to choose the correct guard distance, as shown here, because that will be the width of the skin graft, which is harvested. The guard is placed over the blade, and then the screws of the guard are very easily tightened, and you need to be careful not to tighten them too much. I usually do finger tightness of my non-dominant hand. Here, the dermatome is set to the depth of harvesting, which will be 17 one thousandths of an inch, which is fairly standard for a split graft. Here is the button that turns the electric dermatome on and oscillates the blade. This is the donor site on the lateral thigh, which is then covered with mineral oil, which serves as a lubricant between the blade and the skin. Tension is applied across the wound in order to facilitate graft harvesting. The dermatome is turned on, and then very slowly and carefully, the skin graft is harvested, and you can see the skin collecting here. Care is taken when the, we reach the end of the desired length of the skin graft, because it can remain stuck, it's simply trimmed off. And the donor site, as you can see, is then covered briefly with a towel while we prepare the skin graft. The, the dermatome is then released, and the skin graft is pulled out carefully. And you'll notice as the skin graft contracts, that's called primary contraction. The skin graft is then placed on a board uh, to facilitate meshing of the skin graft, and it's simply rolled out to make sure that it's flat. It's placed on the meshing machine and processed by hand. And then as you can see, holes have been made in the skin graft which facilitate greater area. The skin graft is now sewn into place with an absorbable suture, and great care is taken to suture the skin graft into the wound so that it 
will become adherent to the bed. As you can see, the skin graft has been trimmed from a rectangular shape to more of a elliptical shape. The bottom of the skin graft will be trimmed to fit. Now we finish suturing in the skin graft. We've sewn it down so that it's adherent and we've run a suture all the way around the wound to hold it into place. Here, a vacuum sponge is trimmed to fit and this will serve to stabilize the graft while it heals to the bed. It's cut to position and here it is in position. The sponge has been covered in plastic and now a tube will be placed to allow air to be sucked out of this sponge. Here it's connected to a vacuum. And as you can see, the suction sucks down the sponge into the wound, making the wound bed and the skin graft very adherent. Right. So just an idea of what skin grafting looks like. Um, the downfall to skin grafting, one, skin grafting is a great way to cover the wound. But the downfall to skin grafting is, is now we not only have one wound, we have two. So we now have to worry about that donor site, which is typically that lateral thigh, being an area that can potentially become infected. So the patient who has already got an integumentary system that is compromised, we've just added an op another open area to that skin. So skin grafts are great. However, remember, we do have a second site now that we have to worry about. Um, there's several different types. What you saw in the video was a mesh graft. The meshing process just gives you a greater surface area. So you can take a smaller piece of skin and cover a larger area with it. Sheet grafts, it is what you cut from the donor side is what you get in size with the um, graft. So there's no expansion of that skin with a sheet graft. Up to your physician, what they use. Uh, the interesting thing about mesh grafts is even once they are healed, they will still have that mesh look to them that you have um, scar tissue that comes up in those little holes and they always have that meshed look. Um, so how do you think that skin handles exposure to daily environments versus the rest of the skin? It doesn't heal, it doesn't vary at all. Um, so those areas burn easier, they are easier to develop cuts or wounds or um, scratches on, they're easier to develop cellulitis in, they don't do as well ever as the normal skin that's intact. However, um, they will keep that um, mesh look. So it may be a, a very healed and old graft, it, but they'll still have that mesh look to it. Um, again, in this acute phase, we're monitoring perfection. This child up here in the upper picture, and you don't see it very well, but he has had two grafts removed. He had one off the top of the thigh and off the lateral side of the thigh and he developed an infection in that. So that is just one of those that you have to be mindful of um, the infection that can occur. Again, we talked about pain management. This acute phase, we transition pain, pain management and meds from the IV route to hopefully a PO route um, so that we can transition them home. Again, that emotional support and that psychological evaluation, role play, um, question and answer session continues through this phase. Rehabilitative phase is the longest phase of burns. Anywhere from 12 to 18 months, we can have a rehabilitative phase. This rehabilitative phase is where we get the patient to optimal function, their optimal level of function. Uh, in this phase, there's a lot of education. We have to look for things like hypertrophic scarring. That is a complication <coughs> in the rehabilitative phase, is over scarring that can occur where the burns are. 
To prevent that over scarring, we use pressure dressings. That's what this lady has on in the picture. These compression dressings are worn 23 out of 24 hours a day. They, the only time they take them off is to shower and to turn around and put a new dressing on. So they typically, or the compression dressing, they usually have two or three of them and they rotate them. They wash them out um, and rotate them. But they are solely to prevent hypertrophic <coughs> scarring. So what kind of education do you think these patients need in this rehabilitative phase? What do we need to teach them? Do what now? Not wound care because we won't roll, we won't move into this phase until the wound is covered. Compliance with the dressings, okay. Keeping themselves clean. What about range of motion and preventing contractures with a hypertrophic scarring? What about being out in the sun? If you are out in the sun, what do you need to do? You need sunscreen, you need long sleeves, you need long pants to cover those areas. I'll never forget, my grandparents used to have daylilies. That was my grandmother's hobby. And when I say daylilies, like 10 acres of daylilies, not one or two. And um, so they would spend, my grandparents would literally spend day in and day out outside in their yards. That's what they like to do. And my granddaddy always wore his old dress shirts that were threadbare, they were super thin, but they were long sleeves, and his old dress pants in the garden. He put him a big brimmed hat on, and he, w he was almost blind, so he had these big thick Coke bottle glasses, and he had a plastic chair and a water hose. And he would walk up and down these aisles, and he'd sit down, and he'd hoe a little bit, and he'd water the daylilies, and he'd get up, and he'd drag his chair, and he'd sit down, and he'd hoe, and he'd water all day long, day in and day out. That, he watered and hoed the weeds out of the daylilies. And I always thought, how has he not died of a heat stroke? He is in long sleeves, long pants. It is 100 degrees outside, and he could work circles around me because they'd pay me to come weed the daylilies during the summer. And, you know, I thought, okay, I'll put on my swimsuit and pull my hair up on a ponytail, I'll put on some sunscreen, and I'll get out there and I'll work. Two hours later, I'm dead, and he's still <laughs> hoeing daylilies because he was dressed appropriately for the conditions. When he got hot, guess what he did with that water hose? He took his hat off, put it over his head, soaked his clothes, put his hat back on, and walked, kept going down the aisle because he was prepared for that environment. We have to keep the skin covered, especially this area that is new skin or as a graft or has scar tissue. It's going to burn much easier than their, their regular skin. Um, we also have to talk about nutrition. During this phase, that caloric intake is still high, but guess what? It's going to come down. So that caloric need has, is going to come down, so we've got to transition them off of thousands and thousands of calories back to normal caloric intake um, during this phase. We also have to talk about um, range of motion. Yes, it may be painful, but guess what? You still have to do it. Um, this is an airplane splint. This child probably has burns in the shoulder region and in the armpits. Um, it is to put the, the arms in a neutral position so that he doesn't have um, hypertrophic scarring or uh, contractures from his burns. He's also in compression garments as well, just an example of one of the splints. Um, we've talked about most of the education, avoiding the sun, nutritional needs, range of motion, pressure garments. We haven't talked a whole lot about geriatric considerations with burns, um, but comorbidities is the big one. They're going to have the renal insufficiencies. They're going to have the congestive heart failure. They're the ones that are not going to do as well with burns because they don't have the reserve. They don't have the ability to compensate, um, whereas a patient without the comorbidities. They have a decreased immune function, so they're more susceptible to infection than a younger patient. They have a decreased ability to heal. They have decreased lung compliance. And so all of those things put them at a greater risk um, 
of unfavorable outcomes from a burn. And that is burns. We are done. Yay! We're all excited. It's okay. You can be excited. <laughs> all right, questions. Anything that is burning a hole in your piece of paper that I need to answer? All right, y'all have a great day.